Good morning. Well, my name's Stephen. I'm glad you're here. And uh, if you have a Bible, you can open it up to Acts chapter 3. We're going to wrap up a series today uh, from Acts chapter 3 entitled, By His Name. And that's kind of an interesting series because we're getting to the, um, like the, the title part of the series at the end of the series as opposed to the beginning of the series. And what happened at the beginning of the series uh, was the, the first miracle of the church. And what occurred was uh, there was a lame man and he was carried to the beautiful gate every, uh, every day. And there was one particular day uh, where Peter and John showed up, the, the apostles, and uh, the man looked at them. And when he looked at them, there was this understanding that he was asking for alms or money. And Peter and John said, hey, silver and gold have we none, but in the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. And he did. And then last week we talked about uh, how the, or what the meaning of the miracle is. Why do these moments happen in our lives? Whether it's a physical miracle or it's an inward spiritual transformation, we use the term a movement, like a movement of the heart or a movement of the mind. And uh, we then kind of came up with some terminology around this to help us. Uh, and so if you hear anyone around here go, woo! Hey, it's not weird. We talked about it. It's totally acceptable. And, and, and a woo moment uh, is when you step into that grace zone and something happens that you've been praying about for a really, really long time. And all of a sudden, God just brings it to be. And, and so these miracle or these, uh, these, these movement or these woo moments, last week we talked about why they happen. And today I want to talk about how they happen. How they happen. By what power? By what power? And we just sang this song, what a beautiful name it is, uh, the, the name of Jesus. And, and we sing a lot about the name of Jesus. There's power in the name of Jesus. We talk about it. We proclaim it. Most of us wrap up a prayer with in Jesus' name, amen. But what does this really mean? What, what does it mean that there is power in the name of Jesus? And we know that there's a lot in a name. We name our children uh, certain things, right? I mean, even our, our, our youngest baby, Shay. Uh, we, Lindsay and I were like kind of debating. We were going back and forth, and she told me, no more political figures, okay? We're moving, we're moving on, all right? And I was like, really? Because, you know, I think Roosevelt would be kind of a cool name. And she was like, uh, I don't know. Teddy, of course. And... Um, and, and, and so, uh, you know, we were, we were like talking through that. And she said, no, no, no. She said, what about Shay? And, uh, and, and we were chatting through that. And, uh, and then later she goes, hey, you know, Shay means salvation in Hebrew. I was like, all right, cool, I'm in. Uh, it's pretty easy. I was like, I'm just going to tell everyone it means redemption in Hebrew. And then we're really in, okay? And, uh, and because, you know, names are important. And, and, and let me open up with kind of this thought right here uh, in, in, uh, in Semitic thought, okay, or in, in Jewish thought, when uh, a name does not identify or distinguish a person. In other words, when you say someone's name or when you say there's power in the name or the name of or something like that, we're not just saying, oh, that's Bill, you know, you know, Bill. Right, Bill? It's, it's not that. Uh, it, it's so much more. It expresses the very nature of his being. The very nature of his being. The power, get this, hence the power of the person is present and available in the name of the person. The entirety of the person is present in the name of the person. This is Semitic thought. Uh, and, and so when we, you know, read through the scriptures and we try to understand it written in its kind of, its context, right? And over and over, now that I'm teaching on this, if you haven't already, as you're reading through your New Testament or your Old Testament, you're going to see the phrase in the name, in the name, in the name, in the name, over and over and over again. What does it mean? That's my hope this morning. Now in our kind of context, when we think about something as like uh, someone's name or the entirety of what makes up the person, we would say, oh, that's their identity, right? Like that's a word that we would use uh, uh, to help us understand uh, like something that makes up someone in their entirety. And so when I say a name of somebody, these thoughts come to mind, Miley Cyrus. Okay, we're all on the same page, right? Like these, these thoughts come to mind when, when you hear a name, Billy Graham. 
thoughts come to mind. No one laughed that time, right? Interesting. So uh, there, there's like these names, the, the, you know, the, the identity of them and all of these things. And here's what I want to do this morning. Pretty simple. Pretty simple sermon. What I want to do is I just want to lay out under name and identity three things that help us understand when we talk about in Jesus' name what we're saying. For the rest of your life, you're going to pray in Jesus' name. You're going to hear sermons on Jesus and the power of Jesus' name. And so well, I'm trying to just give you a little bit of understanding uh, that, that might help, some language. And so here, here are the three. I'll just give them to you right from the beginning. Okay? Uh, name, identity, and then under identity it says authority. What kind of power is present? Character. Who is this person? And then track record. What has this person proven over time? And these three things... These things, particularly in Semitic thought, make up the name of a person, the authority, power, the character, the essence, and the heart, and the track record. What are the repeated actions over time? What has this person proven or shown to be? So let's walk through them this morning. Uh, first, we'll talk with the authority. And, and of course, when I'm talking about this, I'm talking about Jesus, right? The authority of Jesus. Uh, in Matthew 28, 18, uh, it simply starts off like this. All authority is given me. The authority that Jesus has was actually granted to him. Uh, he himself says this, and I think it's John 16, where he says, all uh, the authority has, uh, the Father granted me the authority. Uh, and so, quick story of the world. God created the heavens and the earth. He actually created it through Jesus. Uh, and then Jesus comes down in what we call the New Testament uh, to rule and reign on the earth created for him. And in order to rule and to reign on the earth created for him, uh, then what happens uh, is the Father grants all of the authority to the Son. And so over and over, Jesus says, all authority has been given to me. It's an authority that Christ received from the Father. So where did the authority come from? Uh, for Jesus, it came from the Father, right, granted to him. Uh, what does the authority prevail over? If you continue to read Matthew 28, 18, it says, all authority in what? In heaven and on earth. All right, that kind of covers it. In heaven and on earth. So it's authority that he received from the Father. It's an authority that then um, prevails over all of heaven and earth. Okay, how powerful is the authority? Well, Ephesians uh, chapter 1 says it this way. Uh, Christ is far above all rule and authority. Far above. <laughs> He's not barely over the line. He's, he's far above it far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name, above every name that is named. In, in that case, it wouldn't be uh, a name now. They're taking up all of the essence of what it means to be a name, but it's clearly referencing every other name, every other authority that might be present. Christ is way above it. Christ is above every name that is in. So we can go through history and look at the names that thought themselves comparable to Christ. Pharaoh. What happened to him? Baal. What happened to him? Caesar. What happened to him? And we can just go through, through, through all of the names that thought they could compare. But what we learn here simply in Ephesians chapter 1 is that it is an authority that is unmatched. That any power, any other authority, any other name that wants to come up and try to compete with Christ will lose. Jesus' name, Jesus' power extends far above theirs. No one has the same authority as Christ. And so it is an authority that was granted to him by the Father. It is an authority that is over heaven and earth. It is an unmatched authority. No one ought to try and compete, though the enemy certainly does. But what uh, is it an authority, uh, in more particular, we know it's over heaven and earth. What does the authority do? Or how is it, uh, if I can use this word, how is the authority used here on earth? Well, the scriptures tell us uh, these things, that he has authority over sin, that he has authority over death, that he has authority over sickness, that he has authority over powers and principalities, that his authority makes demons shudder, uh, darkness flee, right, and makes the, the roaring lion back down. That he, 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 the lion of Judah is uh, more powerful than, than the roaring lion of this world. 
That's what the authority does, that the authority of Christ speaks into all of these different things. Uh, and I probably missed some important ones, uh, but this is the authority of Jesus. And so in Acts chapter 3, verse 16, when the, there's an explanation of how is it that this man is walking? How is it that this man now has perfect health? Uh, the, the simple response. Uh, uh, Peter, he, he gets asked a, a big question, and he has such a nice, concise answer. Here it is, Acts 3.16. And his name, by faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know. And the faith that is through Jesus has given the man this perfect health in the presence of you all. And so where it says his name, or by faith in his name, what's it saying? His authority. By faith in his authority. By faith in his ability to exert his will. So authority means an ability to exert one's will, right? <laughs> Some of you, you have kids. They think they have authority. No, they don't, right? Amen? Amen. Okay. Yeah. Ability to exert one's will. And Jesus, uh, uh, faith in Christ's ability to exert his will right, is what made him well. That's the first part of it. That's the authority side, okay? All right, let's move on. Next one now. So we have authority. Next thing we have is character. Now, in, in character here, uh, we're not just talking about like the little character trait you got uh, when you were growing up. I always got diligence. I don't know why. It's like the only one I ever got, okay? Um, that and calm down, which isn't really a character trait, but it was said a lot, okay? <laughs> Stop chewing your sweatshirts. Okay, that one was said a lot too. All right, so we'd be like, this makes a lot more sense now. Okay, now, where was I? Character, right. By character, we mean the full essence or, or heart or nature. Okay, and in fact, let's use that word. It's the nature of someone and the heart of someone as their character. And so the character of Christ falls under the name of Christ. And so let's look at Christ's character. Colossians 2, 9 through 10 is a shockingly incredible verse. Colossians 2, 9 through 10. For in him, Christ, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. And you have been filled in Christ, who is the head of all rule and authority. You're gonna read these verses. You're gonna see how all of these things like work together all throughout the scriptures. Like God knew what he was doing. Look at this verse. For in him, the whole fullness of deity dwells Bodily. Okay, you remember the scene in Aladdin? When he's like, big cosmic powers. Tiny little lamp. Massive God. Good, gracious, incredible um, God. Worthy of it all, God. Whew. Dwelt in its fullness in Christ. How amazing. The fullness of deity dwelled in Christ bodily. All of it in Jesus. Incredible. Now, what does that mean? What does it mean that it all dwelt in Christ? Well, we'll use our theme, names, to help us understand a little bit. Because in uh, the Old Testament, there's like 20 different names that are used to describe Jehovah. And, um, and I just want to look at like six of them this morning. Because all of the names that were used in the Old Testament then find themselves fulfilled and complete in Christ. Why? Because all of the fullness of deity dwells in Christ bodily. And so the names of the Old Testament used uh, to describe Jehovah help us understand the nature and the character of Christ. So let me just give you a couple of the names in the Old Testament that help us understand the nature or the character, we'll use that word, the character of Christ. Jehovah Nisi, God is my refuge. Jehovah Jireh, God will provide. Jehovah Rapha, God heals. Jehovah Shalom, God our peace. Jehovah Ra, God our way and shepherd. Jehovah Shema, God is there or he is ever present. These are just six of about 20 names that uh, were used in the Old Testament. And what were they doing in the Old Testament? The specific, uh, specific, you know what word I'm trying to say, of these names were to describe God. 
And then we get into the New Testament, and instead of using this name and 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 uh, name 17 and name 18 and name 19 and name 20 to describe all of the fullness of God, somehow they come up with a new name, Jesus. Jesus. Like, like you're supposed to hear the name Jesus and go, man, he's my refuge. He's my provider. He's my healer. He brought me peace. He is my way and my shepherd, and he is always there with me. Jesus. Jesus. So in the Old Testament, the, the, uh, uh, the, the, the Israelites would be going through a tough time, and they, uh, they'd be wandering in the desert, and like, God, we are so sick of this vegan diet. Amen? Can we get some meat? So he opens up an Arby's right there, and he says, no. And, 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 so, and, and so they're praying, and they're like, we, we, we need something, and Jehovah. Jireh, please. And he's like, man, I'll provide. I'll provide. Jehovah Jireh will provide. And friends, all through the, the New Testament, then you start reading through the Gospels, and what you see is all of these stories that if you read them, they would remind you of the Old Testament, but they don't have to uh, use or reference the name Jireh or Nisi or Rapha or Shalom or anything else. It's just Jesus there in the scene. And so you see Jesus um, being a refuge to the disciples in the storm. You see Jesus providing for the 5,000. You see Jesus healing the lame man. You see Jesus bringing peace by his body on the cross. You see Jesus being the good shepherd, leading them down the right path. You see Jesus at the end saying, I'm going to be with you always to the very end of the age, and I'll prove it by sending my spirit. And so the Old Testament displays it. Jesus then confirms it, and the last year of 2,000 years proves it. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. That's the name. That's what we mean by there's power in the name. And I haven't even gotten into the traits. I could go through a whole other list of all of the traits, so I'll just move through them quickly. That he is gracious, that he is holy, that he is loving, that he is just, that he is forgiving, that he is a pursuing God, that he is a preserving God. You can go through your own life, and you can see the traits of Jesus in that way, winning you to himself, beckoning you to himself. This is the nature, the character, the heart of Jesus, the heart of the name, the heart of the name, the character of the name. Okay, so now we got two things down. When we hear the name of Jesus, we think his authority, his ability to exert as well, his character the fullness of who, who he is, heart and nature. Okay, what about, the, what about the third one? Because don't you know, don't, don't you know, there are people who have authority but no character, right? Yep, okay. If you thought of your boss, stop, okay? There are people who have character and no authority, right? Great nature, great heart, but no authority. There's something powerful about people who have character, authority, and now a track record. Because then you look and you go, okay, okay, okay. So he has the authority. He has the, he has the character. Okay, here's the character. What's his track record? What's his track record? In other words, how has he used his authority? How has his nature, his essence, his character, how has it played out? throughout all of history. What's his track record? Well, let me show you that one then. Uh, I could have gone a hundred different places in the scriptures because, well, it's all his track record. Um, but we decided, or I decided, I guess, uh, that we'll just go to Hebrews. So I'm just going to read uh, the opening part of Hebrews for you, and then I'm going to like skim through Hebrews uh, because it's all about the track record of Jesus, about his track record. And by the way, track record is this. It is the repeated Repeated and consistent actions of a person. That's a track record. Not one time. Not two times. No, a track record is the repeated, consistent action. Repeated, consistent action. Hebrews chapter 1 says this. Long ago, at many times, and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. 
But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God. He is the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. You want to know the track record of Jesus? This whole thing is still spinning. It's all still spinning. So for thousands of years now, he's kept it going. That's a track record. When the world uh, was so bad in the days of Noah that they thought about evil all the time, he kept it spinning. He kept it spinning. When, when his son, uh, when Jesus came down to earth and they wanted to crucify him instead of honor him as king, he kept it spinning. He kept it spinning. And we could look through all of the times of history and know that the word of his power has kept this thing going. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. And he didn't sit down, okay? Like you sit down at the end of the like, whew, I'm done. Okay? No, no, no. He sat down like a king sits on his throne to rule and to reign. He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels, get this, as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. There it is again, the name of Jesus. What? The, the, the authority he has inherited, he has received from the Father, the, the nature and the character, the imprint of his exact nature, and the track record that he has embodied. Now, you keep going through the book of Hebrews, and it just tells you all about the track record of Jesus. Chapter 2 tells you that he was the founder of our salvation. Chapter 3 tells us that he was greater than Moses and that he is our eternal rest. Chapter 4 tells you that he is the great high priest. Uh, Chapter uh, 7 tells you that he's a a priest like out of the order of Melchizedek. That's a story for a different day. Uh, Chapter 8 tells you that he is the high priest of a better covenant. Uh, Chapter 9 tells you that redemption comes through his blood. Uh, Chapter 10 tells you that his sacrifice was once and for all, uh, that he provides a full assurance of faith. Chapter 12 tells you that he is the founder and the perfecter of our faith and that he has created a kingdom that cannot be shaken. This is the track record of Jesus. Now, you could also just go back to the Gospels, and you could read the stories over and over and over again, and you could see his track record. When he spoke, things moved. When he healed, people stay healed. When he was tempted, he withstood. And when he died, he rose again. That's a track record. That's a track record. And I know a track record is you have to do it more than once, but with death, I think that's good enough. That's good enough. That's his track record. And so when we put it all together and we go back to Acts chapter 3 and we say, okay, so uh, how did this man get healed? How is it that he is at perfect health? And let me cut through this a little bit. How is it that woo moments happen? How is it that you and I experience, uh, experience redemption and live in freedom? How is it that, uh, that, that what we were becomes something new? How is it that uh, what you're praying for ends up occurring? How is it that uh, the sin that you've been trying to get over, you finally have the power and you move on from it? How does that happen? Acts 3.16. And his name, by faith in his name name. That's how it happens. By faith in his name. What's faith? Faith is a deep conviction that leads to action. It's your best definition. It's very simple. Faith is a deep conviction that leads to action. Faith is a deep conviction that leads to action. And so in Acts uh, 3.16, it's saying this, and his name, and Jesus, his name, and his name, by faith, by a deep conviction in his name, by a deep conviction in his authority, in his character, and in his track record. That's how. I believe it. By a deep conviction in all of those three, that's how this happens. That's how God moves in our lives. Now, we could end the sermon this morning, and and we could be done here, and, uh, and I think there would be an element, I hope, that we have learned something today. But, I, but before we wrap up, I want to take all of this information now that we have laid out and all of this understanding and talk for a second then how that translates into uh, our lives. How does this idea then that there is power in the name of Jesus, how does that begin to work through the follower of Christ? How does this happen? Well, 
Colossians chapter 3. A lot of time in Colossians today. I'm going to hit a bunch of verses here. Uh, Colossians chapter 3. Let me start in Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 through 4, because this is a startling idea. If then you have been raised with Christ, let me say it again. If then you have had faith in the name of Christ, if you have had faith in the name of Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. Now, verse 3 and 4. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ who is your life appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Let me rephrase that. Some of the other translations say it this way. Um, when, instead of saying your life, one translation says your identity. Your identity is now in Christ. Let me say it another way. Your name has gone. You have taken on his name. Now we have just talked about what it to, uh, for the name of Jesus, for there to be power in the name of Jesus, uh, its authority, its character, and its track record. And then the scriptures tell us that when we have faith in Christ, we inherit the name. We get clothed or we get covered in the name of Jesus. So what's in a name? What's in a name? Authority is in a name. Character. Heart is in a name. Track record is in a name. And if you now carry the name of Jesus, so what does that mean? If your identity is now um, um, clothed in Christ, what does that now mean? Well, first, first I would say it means that you have a new type of authority, my friend. You have a new type of authority that you now carry in the name of Christ. You want to, let me tell you, authority plays out, by the way. Um, It it certainly plays out by the Holy Spirit alive in you. But um, let me use someone's words, Jesus' words, to tell us about what this authority looks like. Truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me, has faith in the name, will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do. I'm reading out of John 14, because I am going to the Father. Listen to the language. Whatever you ask, what? In my name. This I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. And uh, later on in in Matthew chapter uh, 16 and 18, we see two other ideas that um, this is an individual, but it is also corporate because where two or three are gathered there, he is also. And then where two or three gathered and they pray in the name of Jesus, he says the authority will be granted to the church to pray in the name of Jesus for things to be loosed or bound in heaven and earth. That the authority uh, somehow is transferred to those who bear the name of Jesus. That means there is an authority that rests now in you. There is an authority. There is a new power that resides in you. And so why is it that that sin continues to have control over you? There is a new authority that rests in you. This authority then gets exercised through prayer. And this is exceptionally practical. Waking up and knowing, man, I woke up today and uh, uh, and all I'm feeling and all I'm sensing is darkness and it's all around and there feels like there's something in this house right now and I can feel it between uh, me and my spouse or I can feel it between me and my kids or I can sense that there's something going on in my kid. Not in your house. You have the authority of Jesus in his name. In his name. And sometimes, guys, uh, dads in particular, I know we do this. We think, okay, this thing's getting out of control a little bit around here. And so I'm going to exercise my authority. I'm going to exercise my name. Listen, dad, before you start exercising your name and your authority, exercise his name and his authority over it first. Because you might be coming in trying to exercise your name, your authority. But if you got a spiritual problem going on, let me tell you about your name. It means nothing. His name means something. 
And so this changes the way we pray. I'm not going to let uh, uh, an unmatched authority reside. Not in our church, not in your house, not in your marriage, not in yourself. You have power in his name. Okay, let me, uh, let me play this out again a little bit more. Because uh, this is, again, it's not just individual. It's also corporate. And so this means that the church has power in the name of Jesus. That we have power. And what does the enemy want to do? The enemy wants us to think, don't worry, everything's fine. Don't worry about it. It's all good. Everything is, is totally fine. In fact, Peggy, you can go ahead and just throw that up there. Okay? That's what the enemy wants us to think. Don't worry, everything's fine. I know your marriage is a mess, don't worry, everything is fine. I know the world is trying to brainwash our children right now and normalize sinful behavior. Don't worry, everything's fine. I know that when you flip on the news right now or you, uh, you start listening to people who are in high positions of influence, whether that's culture or politically or whatever, that they're saying things that are the complete opposite of the truth of scripture and trying to create a society that thinks sin is great. Don't worry, everything's fine. Can I tell you something? On one hand, the Christian says, don't worry, everything is fine because we know the name that is above every other name. But on the other hand, the church can't say, don't worry, everything is fine because we know the name above every other name if the church doesn't exercise its authority in that name over the other names. Because in that regard then, guess what? Everything's not fine. But when we understand that the church, okay, and we'll just talk about our church right now, that this church has been granted to, uh, by God, the, the, the ability to carry the name of Jesus, authority that we need to begin to exercise, okay? By the way, that up there, don't worry, everything is fine, Satan. Um, I'm actually going to talk about this a lot. For the, that's our next mailer. We're going to send that out to 43,000 people. Okay, which is going to be really fun. Okay, and I'll show you the back next week because it's even more fun, right? But um, in, in October 23rd, we're going to kick off a series called Clear Truths for a Confused World. Okay, and oh, it's, it's going to be fun. And um, I'm going to preach five weeks in a row on, well, that's not that much news. Okay, so I'm going to preach. <laughs> I'm going to do my job. <laughs> Five whole weeks. Okay. All right. Um, okay. Five weeks. We're going to go clear truth for men. Okay. Act like men. That's what the Bible says. Act like men. Okay. Don't act like ungodly men. Don't act like a woman. Act like a, act like a man. Number two, women. Okay, clear truths for women. Number three, clear truths for marriage. Number four, clear truths for family. Okay, number five, clear truths for society. All right, we're just going to go through it for five weeks. We're going to give you a whole bunch of stuff that you can use to pass out to people. Okay, and my whole point in this when we were sitting down with the team is if people don't read this and go, man, that's exactly what we've been talking about at the kitchen table, then we didn't do it right. Okay, because this is the stuff that is happening. Everything is not fine, and we're going to raise the alarm. Sound good? Cool. All right. Um, next week, we're going to kick off a series called Stop the Spread. Okay? We'll just do, we'll just do two weeks. Okay? That's a better joke. Come on. That's pretty good. I thought long and hard about that. All right. Um, all right. We are really doing a series called Stop the Spread because in Acts chapter 4, uh, the, the, the enemies of this world, this, 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 this is the end of the sermon, the enemies of this world, they get together and they go, how are we going to do this? How are we going to do this? This thing is spreading and it is spreading and it is spreading and it's spreading. They go, oh, I got it. Let's just tell them to not mention the name of Jesus. And so we're just going to keep mentioning the name of Jesus. And we're going to end today, right, this part of the series, by understanding the nature of the name of Jesus. Okay. Number two. Yes, you have an authority. You have an authority in the name of Christ. Okay? And that part is fun. And this part should be fun, too. 
But we can't escape it. What's the second neat part of it? Character. Character. And so as individuals and as a church, my friends, we can't just get excited about the authority of Jesus. We have to get excited about the character of Jesus. And so immediately after Paul writes this, in Colossians chapter 3, he says this, put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. Sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these things, the wrath of God is coming. In these you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander. I don't know why. Maybe it was the rise of the internet, but at some point in time, Christians just decided that gossip was now okay. I don't care if you type it, text it, or speak it. It's all sin. And obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices. Then he says this, put on then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bear with one another. And if one has complained against another, forgive each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Amen. It's fun to talk about the authority of Jesus. Friends, we've got to put on the character of Jesus. And so I hope that this here would compel any of us, as any of that list hit, to repent before him, to allow the power of his name and authority to work through you and to walk in holiness. And there will always be, always be a tie between what God does through his church and, and, and the way his church pursues holiness. And so may we do that. If you need to talk about something, that's why we have elders, okay? You can talk to me, right? Um, but let's, let's give up. Let's put off what needs to be put off. Let's put on what needs to be put on, all right? Number three, third thing, track record, track record. I'm gonna take a drink of water before I get into this one. Track record, we're still in Colossians. Remember, track record is the repeated actions of a person. We saw Jesus' track record, and here's what I think we need to understand about track record. I'm gonna start in verse 13 of chapter two. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, there's your track record. That's ours. Our track record is this, that in our authority and in our name, our identity, right, when, when, when our name reached God's ears, when our name reached God's ears, or when our name would have reached God's ears on judgment day, what God would have heard, the track record he would have seen is dead in your trespasses. You say, oh, no, 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 uh, Stephen, I did this, and I did that, and, uh, and, I, and, and, I, uh, and I gave, and I served, and I, uh, and I was nice to this person. I came to church consistently, and all of this kind of stuff. No, no, no. A apart from faith in his name, this is your track record. You were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh. But look what Jesus did. God made alive together with Jesus. God made you alive together with Jesus, having forgiven us our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it on the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities, and he put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. That one preaches itself, but what's going on here is this, that the, the ruler of this world, the accuser of this world stood accusing you and saying, that name right there, your name, he was using your name, the enemy was by your specific name, knowing every part of your sin, knowing every place that you had failed and going to the Father, you can't let that person with that track record in. And then Jesus showed up and what he did is he he went to the cross, and when he was on the cross, he didn't go there with, uh, uh, he went to the cross, and in that moment faced the wrath of it, and there in that moment, he took on your name, your name. 
And so he's on the cross and he's receiving the wrath and the punishment of God as a result of your track record. Why? So that when he rose from the grave, he could give you his track record. And that's the gospel. And here's what the enemy loves to do. This is where I'll wrap up this, uh, uh, this, this morning. Uh, here's what the enemy loves to do. The enemy loves to send people, uh, the rulers and the authorities and, and the enemies uh, of your soul, the one who wants to strip your abundant life. He wants to send people, and he loves to send people in your life that try to remind you of your track record. That's what he loves to do. And so I, I want to end this with, with some of you uh, today because, listen, you can, um, you can, you can uh, understand the authority that now rests in Christ in you. You can say, I'm going to put to death and I'm going to put on. But you know what the enemy loves to do? Even as you move through the first two things of the name, as you're moving in to number three, the track record that is there often that the enemy will say, okay, oh, listen, they now understand the authority they have in Jesus and his character or her character is changing. But what I'll do is I'll make them dormant or I will make them passive. I will make them quit. I will make them stop. Make them not exercise. It's the enemy, their power and the authority and the character that they had by reminding him or her of their track record. This is what the enemy will do. Because you're gearing up, you're gearing up to walk in your authority, you're gearing up to, uh, to let the character change and everything like that. And then he goes, oh man, I lost the first two, but I can win the third. And if I can get them to live in the shame and guilt of their track record, then they won't go and be used in the name. The other day, Lindsay and I were walking through the neighborhood, and uh, we just had uh, Babe Shea with us. And, and so the three of us are walking through the neighborhood. Well, Shea wasn't walking, but the other two of us, that'd be incredible in Jesus' name, right? Okay. <laughs> And so the, uh, we're walking, and as we're walking, some guy rolls uh, up in his, in his car, and uh, he's probably in his early 60s, and he goes, hey, man, how about that Browns game? And I was like, Lindsay, do you know this guy? <laughs> and, uh, and I was like, yeah, they, they won. That was incredible. He goes, man, that field goal, like the way we talked about it, and then they kicked the field goal, and they, and, and they won, like it's that incredible? And I'm like, yeah, that was good. I'm like, I said, Lindsay, do you know who this guy is? It's like, all right. And, and we're like having this conversation. He looks and he goes, oh man, I got you confused for someone else. I said, that's right. You don't put that kind of shame and sin on me. I am not a Browns fan. So you send that back. You will not drive by and make me a Browns fan. In Jesus' name. And the enemy will love to drive by your life and use a voice to tell you, hey, how about that? Don't you remember that? And there is only one response. I think you got me confused for someone else. I'm wearing a new name. Jesus' name. And so don't put that on me. I'm walking. You're walking. We're walking. In the full name of Jesus. We're doing it together, guys. Next few weeks, I think, are going to be some of the most fun weeks we have had as a church. And so before we hop into it, let's pray in Jesus' name. Let's pray in Jesus' name. Will you join me? Father, I pray for every follower of Christ in this room. Well, first of all, I pray for any of you who are not. If you have never believed in the name of Jesus, you're missing out. Do it right now. Believe in his name. Believe in the track record of him rising from the grave. And Father, I pray that each of us would be able to walk in proper authority in our homes, in our marriages, in our prayer life. And Father, I pray that we would put on and put off I pray right now for anyone in this room who's struggling in sin. The time has come. Put it off. Put it off. Put it off. Put on Jesus. Put on Jesus. Help us to do that, Lord. We need your power. And Father, I pray anyone who's still walking in the old track record, 
the enemy is using to stop them. Help them to walk in the new one. You're looking down and you see one track record, Jesus. And Father, I pray now, because the track record has a past, but the track record eventually will have a different past, which is our future. And so may our new track record be one of walking in full alignment with you, in your fullness and your power. And Father, I pray that you would unite us as a church over these next few weeks, that you would energize us and excite us for the work that you want to do in your kingdom. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us today. If you'd like to take a next step with Redemption Church, visit us online at experienceredemption.com slash connect card. You can also give online to support the work of Redemption Church. To explore your giving options, visit experienceredemption.com slash give online. We hope that the message you heard today encouraged you. See you again soon.